And so I think it's more likely because he's going to get so many votes from Democrats. I mean, I've seen Bernie Sanders voters saying, I'm going to go to him. I mean, what you just said makes no sense to me because unless they do what Trump wants to do, they're never going to win another election, ever. To, to go back to what we were talking about earlier in brokered conventions, um, if I can toot my own horn just a little bit here, I've, I've produced a video that's going to be up tomorrow about noon, and it's uh, drawing parallels between this Republican nomination and the one that took place in 1912. And... I think I, I've heard people comparing this one to 1968 and the and how the Democrats nominated Hubert Humphrey over the will of the primary voters who voted for Eugene McCarthy and basically anyone but LBJ, you know. Uh, but I think 1912 might be even more applicable because what happened after the 1968 nomination is that the Democrats were disheartened but did not split. What happened in 1912 was there was a fight on the convention floor between Roosevelt and Taft. The party nominated Taft over Roosevelt, even though Roosevelt had won 9 of 12 primaries. And then what actually happened was the party split. You had the Progressive Party, the Bull Moose Party, the Republicans, they split 50% of the vote, handed the election to Woodrow Wilson with about 40% of the vote. And I, from what I can tell in reading the news, is that the Republicans are ready to contest the election, or I'm sorry, contest the convention, and if should they lose... They're planning on doing a third party run, whether it be a conservative third party or some sort of desperate establishment third party. And in, in any case, if they pull off shenanigans at the convention, then Trump will probably be the one that runs third. I think the possibility of a true schism is very real. And so That's I think 1912 I is a, a good example. When I said if they want to sink the ship that is the Republican Party, I mean, like Trump just embodies everything about what you just said that discussed a big percentage of the voting base. They're sick of these guys running the entire show, saying, we don't care what you people say, it's going to be one of our guys. It's going to be an establishment guy. Hmm. That's what you saw with can... Jim Romney. And just the disgust, when I see him doing what he did the other day, comparison to when, oh, when he was running and Trump was giving him money, just <laughs> setting up there, just, oh, he's just so great. <laughs> have this endorsement. He embodies everything we stand for. And then turn around and do, when you see those clips back to back, it's disgusting. That's why it doesn't matter what they do, how much they try to destroy Trump's reputation, it's not going to work with his voting base. But no matter I how much the media tries, no matter how much the Republican establishment tries, no matter how much the Democrats try, it's not going to work. I don't, I don't mean to, to filibuster here, but I, I do have a little bit of input as well on this, though, and that is that the Republican establishment might be betraying the will of their base. However, they are being strategic, and what I mean by that is that the, the, the demographic map, the math of the general election was already unfavorable for the Republicans going into 2016. Any generic Democrat could probably expect to win about 257 electoral votes of the 270 necessary. There's only about nine states nowadays that one could really consider a, a swing state, which means that actually I actually have it written down here. Um, if the Democrats were to win with their 257, any generic Democrat, either Florida, Ohio, Virginia, or North Carolina, <laughs> any of those four swing states, and they've got the 270, the election's over. Any combination of Missouri, Colorado, Iowa, West Virginia, Arizona will do the same thing. And so the challenge for the Republicans is they were going to have to win – basically nine swing states in 2016 in order to win the White House. That was already looking unlikely without, even if you just take Jeb Bush or some sort of really like generic palatable Republican, that was already looking unlikely. You take someone like Donald Trump and that becomes infinitely less likely. And so I think, I think it's more likely because he's going to get so many votes from Democrats. I mean, I've seen Bernie Sanders voters saying, I'm going to go to him. I mean, what you just said makes no sense to me, because unless they do what Trump wants to do, they're never going to win another election, ever. You have to stop illegal immigration. I think, you have uh, to stop the bleeding of that demographics change. Right, yeah. That's the, what's really going on, and half the people I know do not see it. I think it's, it's false to assume. The scenario where they're never going to win another election unless they listen to Trump. 
I think it's your false to assume that, that split their own throat and uh, die. Either way. Yeah. Are you done? Because I keep cutting you off. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Well, I was just going to say that it is false to assume that um, whoever runs, whoever ends up splitting the Republican Party, which I do, I do feel like the Republican Party is. This is this could go bad for the Republican Party this year, and everybody knows it. Um, but I think so they just won't let the person that's supposed to win win. Well, but even how if how dumb is this? Even if uh, Trump wins the nomination, well, he should. I mean, Trump. If he loses the nomination, I'd be very surprised. Yeah, at this it's point. a it's a complete ripoff if he loses. Right, but you're going to have a lot Bernie of people Sanders that Bernie are... Sanders is doing a little better. The Democrats would be willing to do the same thing to him. You're going to have a lot of people that are upset, and so you're going to have a split for sure. You're going to have people that refuse to either vote for Trump, or you're going to have people that refuse to to support uh, Cruz or Rubio. And they will ensure Hillary uh, wins. Well, that's see, that's, that's a little that's, that's a little thinner. They are. That's a little false, like to me, like to assume, like to assume that no, a group of people the that vote, are, if they run a third party, Hillary wins if she's not in prison. To us, okay, to assume that that these these people who do split the Republican Party, like and you're kind of contradicting yourself, Robert, because you actually just said that Trump gets a lot of support from Democrats or independents, which I think is true, like. Although I do think a the lot of people from the the people who are on the <laughs> other side that are upset for the exact same reasons. Yeah, um, but I I just think that we Hillary's we think people that people aren't going to vote for Donald. Burn some of Bernie's will. I think as pundits we just assume that we've got voters figured out when we don't. The majority of people in this country um, are independent. That's a fact. They don't they don't they're not strongly partisan on either side. Um, and they, the majority of this country would be what I class, classify as moderate. Um, they, their views evolve. Okay, um, they, their views change when they're brought new information. And I think it's a, uh, the evidence is shaky at best throughout American history to assume, like say, the election of 2000, that Ralph Nader prevented Al Gore from winning that election. Well, if you actually examine that, the evidence is shaky. There's not really. A lot of the the votes. Well, uh, Nader got ten thousand votes in Florida. How many of those ten thousand would have voted for a Republican? It's the Green Party. No. I mean, what was it? No. Five hundred forty-eight votes that but, were lost by. Yeah, but that's assuming those people would have voted for Democrat otherwise. These people probably wouldn't have voted otherwise. That's my point. Is that? I mean, are communist, socialist party? What else are they going to vote for? They're not voting for Bush. No, but but listen to what I said again. These voters are not going to vote for some a candidate that they don't like, and so that means they're either not going I to vote do at it all. Every time I vote, I had to do it last Tuesday. Not, but not not it. And I've got to have a I voted sticker. But not everybody's like you, Robert. I think a lot of people, um, if they don't like the candidates, they're either going to vote for a third party candidate, or they're not going to vote at all. And the, um, this kind of leads to what I was going to bring up uh, later on here, where we look at um, voter turnout, which still is historically low. Like we we look at, uh, especially at the primary level, and, and these caucuses and primaries, they hardly anybody. I mean, I, I uh, went to the ca caucus today because it's when we're recording this. This is March 5th. It's a uh, Kansas has today, so we uh, I show up and I'm the youngest person in the room by far. Okay, so we have a lot of people that are pretty much deciding the fate of a of a candidate for a major political party who don't represent the majority of of Americans here. So we a lot of people feel like what's the point? You know, the electoral college is a an, a discussion we could have, you know, an entire podcast on and how, about how <laughs> archaic it is now. And yeah, I think please most, do. I mean, yeah, I mean. Also, the the fact that caucuses take so long. I think it's good that Kansas has theirs on a Saturday. That's a little different. But like Iowa, for example, if you're a working person, you work an eight-hour day. You got kids at home that come home from school or whatever. And then you got to go to a three-hour caucus in order to participate in the democracy and have a say in the in the nominee of your party. I think is is a a, a little bit undemocratic to say the least. I mean, at least you're. I mean, you are voting. Yeah, you're definitely not voting. Easy. It's high. Yeah, you're, you're setting the bar incredibly high for someone who, you know, I mean, if the idea of a democracy is to get normal people to come out and participate, 
And of course, that's what the parties want. The parties want normal people to come out and, and get involved. Then a, a caucus is the exact way to, to make sure the opposite happens. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I interject really quick here on the uh, earlier, uh, I didn't mean to sound like a presumptuous Democrat and be like, oh, 257, we're on the verge of 270, what an easy election. <laughs> I, it, would be, it would be very presumptuous and false to assume that, that Donald Trump would not be a formidable general election candidate. I was just talking more about general trends in the Electoral College, and some of the math, though, is pretty, is pretty stacked against Trump. And we mentioned Hispanic voters. You know, George W. Bush in 2004 raked in about 44% of the Hispanic vote, and that played a big part in his win. Mitt Romney in 2012 got about 27%, something like that, and, and he was clobbered, um, and in the Electoral College, that is. And over time, that demographic continues to grow. And so I think that there are some major mathematical issues for any Republican candidate, but especially Donald Trump, who's got an 80% unfavorability rating with Hispanics that, that would put the winds against his sales in a general election. But I've seen plenty. I mean, it could just be they're trotting them out there, but I've seen plenty of Hispanics that support Trump. I've got students I teach who are Hispanic who are going to vote for Donald Trump. Sure. I mean, I'm sure there are people. I mean, like I said, that if eight of ten don't like him, that means two of ten probably do. Um, oh, and they but say, the overall numbers and trends don't seem to, to point that to in that direction. Well, it's got to point towards stuff like him saying, "I support Planned Parenthood." You've got to start pulling people from the middle too. Mm -hmm. When he goes out there and he contradicts the Republican establishment yeah. on a lot of things. I mean, the guy used to be very liberal. Yeah, so like the Iraq War is a great example too. I mean, he's, I mean, yeah, sometimes man, Donald Trump speaks, speaks and, and I'm just like, who are you? Like, you're all over the place, and he contradicts himself all the time too. I'm just, a person who <laughs> thinks for himself. He, well, yeah, and he and, also and he will change his views whenever he thinks it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, to go into to a little bit more, I think 2008 was the most high turnout election in recent history, about 60% almost. Yeah. Um, compare that to 2014, which was like 30-something, really pathetic. Um, one trend on the Republican side right now is a high turnout. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Donald Trump is in the race. Um, I think, though, that in a general election, that Donald Trump's presence would boost turnout all over the place for, for, for liberal Democrats as well who were afraid of a Donald Trump or a Ted Cruz getting a Supreme Court nomination.